uh, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Professor Richard Ashby Wilson. He is a Gladstein Distinguished Chair of Human Rights and Professor of Law and Anthropology at University of Connecticut School of Law. Uh, he, he's also the founding director of the Human Rights Institute at UConn, which is one of the most uh, uh, widely uh, recognized and renowned human rights uh, institutions on university campuses across the United States. Um, Richard has received, he received his uh, uh, PhD in anthropology from the London School of Economics and Political Science and uh, he has taught at uh, universities of Essex and Sussex in the UK. Uh, he has also, and then he moved to Yukon after that. He has also taught as a visiting professor at uh, Free University Amsterdam, University of Oslo, the New School for Social Research, uh, University of Sand in South Africa, and so on. And he has received uh, many prestigious fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Institute for Advanced uh, Study at Princeton, and currently this year he he has a fellowship at the uh, Association Foundation in New York. If you know that fellowship, it's a very prestigious one, it's a very cushy one, so he has this place in New York City, uh, housing and office space, and uh, we took... <laughs> yes, yes, please get this message. Um, <laughs> Um, we're pleased to take him, yank him away for at least a couple of days to visit here to give a lecture. Um, he's uh, uh, widely published, uh, he's published more than 10 books uh, as author uh, or editor, uh, all on something about international human rights, humanitarianism, truth and reconciliation, post-conflict justice. Um, his first couple of books are, are about my resurgence in Guatemala, and uh, then uh, politics of truth and reconciliation in South Africa. And then he moved on to a book on uh, uh, entitled Writing History in International Criminal Trials, which is about how law and uh, history um, are combined in the courtroom, giving rights to uh, historical accounts about large-scale violence. And his most recent book is Incitement on Trial, Prosecuting International Speech Crimes, uh, which he, he will uh, present on today. It is, it's, a, it's a truly path-breaking work that uh, looks at why international criminal tribunals uh, attempt to convict individuals for inciting speech. Uh, um, those attempts have mostly failed in the past, and why is that? And he tries to propose a new model of prevention and punishment of uh, hate speech and genocide uh, in general. So uh, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Richard Wilson. Thank you, Thank you for that very generous introduction. Uh, it's a funny room, so I think I'm just going to walk around and so I can look at you all. And uh, I might sit at a few tables, so don't fall asleep. <laughs> Uh, it is 4.15, which is a tough time of day for me. It's kind of a nice nap time, but I'm going to try and be animated. And I think it is an exciting subject. I'll be talking to you about uh, the rigors of holding insiders responsible. If you've read Aristotle's Rhetoric, and it's a great book, um, it's also a short book, he starts by saying, you know, we, we think that the planner and the person who encourages others is just as responsible as the people who commit the crimes. And this is you know, over 2,000 years ago in a faraway place. That idea was still strongly held. And it's still held quite widely today by various publics. But it seems quite difficult to do practically. So that's what today is about, about how international tribunals have sought to hold purveyors of hate speech and incitement criminally responsible. So I have a book that just came out uh, a couple weeks ago, there it is. Please, uh, it's in paperback, so it's not too expensive. Uh, please buy it and read it, or, or ev even just buy it. Um, <laughs> and uh, it took me six years. I, I really labored on this to try and make sense of it. And it emerged out of my last book, which was about the use of historical debates in criminal trials and this complex relationship when history enters the courtroom. How is history used to make certain types of arguments about criminal liability? 
And while I was doing that research, I was reading these various trials, and I was struck by a problem. And that is, why is it that speech crimes so often end in acquittal? Practically, these cases, in these cases, the defendant is more likely to be acquitted than in any other type of international criminal trial. About 50% of the defendants charged are acquitted. Compared with war crimes, where about 90 plus percent of the defendants are convicted. So what's going on here? Why are the outcomes unpredictable? You know, I spend a lot of time going to The Hague and talking to judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys. And pretty much everybody knows the outcome of the trial before the trial is over. They have a good sense. Well, he's going to be acquitted of this, but he'll probably be convicted of that. And that one we don't know about. But there's usually quite a consensus because there's a fairly predictable body of rules and standards for evidence that everyone knows about. And you can more or less predict it. With these speech crimes cases, no one knows. They're like, we don't know what's going to happen. I found that very interesting when I was talking to the legal actors. Why is this such an unsettled area of law? And not only international law, but domestic law too. So First Amendment jurisprudence in the US is one of the hardest areas of constitutional law. It makes your brain explode. If any of you go to law school, as I know some of you are intending, when you do constitution, uh, 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 when you take your constitutional law course, the First Amendment stuff just makes your head explode. It's much harder than contracts. It's so complicated. It's interesting, though. It's very interesting why that's the case. So I, I wanted to figure this out. Here are some of the examples that I refer to of individuals who were charged at international tribunals. So uh, here's Hans Fritz, Nazi propagandist, second to Goebbels. He gives awful discriminatory anti-Semitic speeches during the Holocaust. He is second in command to Goebbels, who commits suicide. So they get him. He's one of the only two who are acquitted at Nuremberg. Then you have Joshua Sang, a radio DJ in Kenya, and William Ruto, vice president of Kenya. Ruto is giving speeches against other ethnic groups, particularly the Kikuyu, during the 2007 elections. Sang is his sidekick, his radio DJ, who, who drives Ruto's supporters to attack Kikuyus on election day. About 1,200 people die in inter-ethnic animosity. Both of them are indicted by the ICC. The, course col the, the, the court case collapses last year for lack of evidence. Bizimungu, who was head of the Rwandan army, convicted of, uh, sorry, uh, uh, charged with incitement to genocide, inciting troops to commit genocide, he's acquitted. You have Mburushimana, who is a propagandist in the Congo. Five million people died in the Congo in the 1990s. He's the propagandist for one of the rebel groups in Ituri province. He's acquitted. The case collapses. And then finally, Sheshel, uh, earlier this year, Serb nationalist, nine charges of crimes against humanity for inciting his followers to burn and pillage and rape and murder Bosnian, sorry, Serbian Muslims and Serbian Croats and drive them into uh, other nations. He's acquitted of all nine charges. It's kind of a challenge to figure out what's going on here. Why is this the case? So I looked into about 35 cases at international tribunals. These are the, the three, sorry, the four tribunals that I focused on. So here we have, uh, actually this is just a little bit out of date. I forgot to update this. We have one trial that's still ongoing, and there are 12 acquittals. Just to give you a sense of the number. So the first question we have to ask is, what charges are people being acquitted of, and where are they being convicted? Well, most of the convictions are for what's called inchoate crimes. Inchoate crimes are a class of crime where the conduct is the crime itself. There need be no further consequences. So in the United States, there are three inchoate crimes. Attempt, attempted murder. You need not murder. You need only attempt. Conspiracy, so you enter into a plan to commit a crime with uh, uh, two or more people. 
You may plan the crime. You may not carry it out. There may be no consequences, but you can still be convicted of a conspiracy to murder or conspiracy to rob a bank. <coughs> and in the United States, uh, solicitation. So you can solicit a crime. It may not be committed. You may be talking to an FBI agent, but you've committed a crime simply by the verbal solicitation. Those are inchoate crimes. In international law, there's only two. It's kind of really only one and a half. Direct and public incitement of genocide, which comes from the Genocide Convention, 1948, is well established. There are a number of convictions. We have three of them here. Julius Stryker at Nuremberg, uh, Georges Ruggio uh, for, the, for Rwanda, and Ferdinand Nahimana. This is actually uh, not the individuals themselves. It's a, a German play called Hate Radio, and these are actors playing their parts, but I like the photograph because it shows them in uh, the offices of RTLM uh, in Rwanda. George Ruggio, just as a, a kind of morality tale, was a Belgian student who was sent on an internship to Rwanda and was interning at the radio station and became part of the incitement of the genocide. An astonishing story. There are good internships and there are bad internships. <laughs> Make sure you don't go on a genocidal internship when you're putting in your study abroad applications. Not something the Human Rights Institute. So, these, uh, so Nahimana is convicted of hate speech. He's the only conviction, along with Ruggio, of hate speech as a form of persecution. The other tribunals don't like it. Never happens in the former Yugoslavia or Nuremberg, and the ICC doesn't have hate speech in its statutes. So it's really kind of one and a half crimes are inchoate crimes. The conduct is the crime. The speech act is the crime. The intentionality to commit a crime is contained in the speech act, and that's the crime. There need be no further consequences. This is where the vast majority of convictions are for speech crimes. So where are the acquittals happening? They're happening in another class of crimes, which are modes of liability that attach to underlying crimes. So the underlying crimes are crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. And the modes of liability are things like perpetrating the crime, where you must have made an essential contribution. These are the, the terms of international law. Instigating the crime, where you have to have made a substantial contribution ordering the crime, disseminating propaganda as part of a joint criminal enterprise. I can send you these slides, by the way, if you don't want to write all this down. I, I can give it to Keo and he can share it with you. Um, and then aiding and abetting. They all have certain causal thresholds that you can see there of the contribution of the speech act. This is where most of the acquittals are happening. And in my diagnosis, it's because of this. They all require proof of causation. They all require proof that the Speech Act caused the subsequent violations. That X led to Y led to Z, where Y is the Speech Act. There are all kinds of problems with showing causation. Causation is one of the deepest and most intractable problems of human thought. I've given, some, uh, given this, this talk to a group of philosophers, and they said, you did really well with causation, but just don't touch it. Just leave it alone. It's too hard. We've been working on this for you know, a thousand years, and we can't make sense of it. But they all require proof on the part of the prosecution that the Speaker's Speech Act was the cause that made a, an essential contribution, a significant contribution, a substantial contribution, depending on the mode of liability, to the Violent Act itself. There are all kinds of problems here. How do you know it was the Speech Act and not something else? Maybe the Speaker spoke to the individual. So maybe I said to, to um, you know, the, the professor from history here, uh, 
you know, why don't we go steal some coffee later? And she goes and steals the coffee, but it was not because I said it, but because she went home and, you know, her partner looked in the fridge and said, we have no coffee, we have no money, I'm going to die. And so that was what's called a superseding cause, which takes over from my speech act. There's another cause that's actually more important than my speech act. And judges are always asking, were there other causes that may have superseded this cause? There are all kinds of difficult issues here. How do you prove causation? This is a picture of Nahimana, who ran the radio station, RTLM. He was actually a, this is another, <laughs> this is another morality tale. He was actually a professor at the university in Rwanda, which is how he got the intern from Belgium, Georges Ruggio. So uh, any of you professors, you know, don't set up a radio station based on ethnic hostility. How do we know? that there's causation. Well, it's causation in speech acts. It's causation of a particular kind. It's not physical causation. It's mental causation. When I asked a judge, actually a Dutch judge, explain to me the type of causation you're looking for when you're adjudicating a mode of liability like instigating, what What's the causal nexus you're looking for? The judge says, mental causation. I, I plant in the mind the not yet existing intention that the crime be committed. So I went to prosecutors and I said, what's the best evidence you can have for instigating? And they said things like this to me. The testimony of an insider, one of the followers of the speaker, who said, I heard his words and I would die for him and do anything he says. He was an authority figure who commanded my behavior. I heard his words and I acted. So the proof of causation that's paramount here is the testimony of an insider who talks about their intentionality having formed only upon hearing the speaker. If they held that intentionality, or they were somehow being commanded from another source, the defendant walks. So how difficult is it to show causation? Well, it's really hard. Partly because international institutions are quite structurally weak. We think, oh, the International Criminal Court, that must be this incredibly powerful body that can just reach out and pluck defendants and drag them to prison, kicking and screaming. Actually, international institutions are quite weak. Does anybody have any idea of the budget of the United Nations, the whole United Nations that sponsored the Rwanda Tribunal and the Yugoslav Tribunal? Anyone have a ballpark figure of how big that budget is? Last time I looked, it was around five or six billion dollars, which is smaller than the NYPD's budget. So the New York Police Department has to keep the lid on the five boroughs of New York, which is not an easy thing. And the UN has to keep the lid on the entire world, and they have the same budget. Anyone know the Pentagon's budget? <laughs> six to seven hundred billion. Right. So international institutions are quite small, quite weak. Luis Moreno Ocampo, who is the former chief prosecutor, he said, look, when I was an Argentine prosecutor and I wanted to arrest someone, I had 30,000 policemen and women in Argentina to carry out my arrest warrant. Here in The Hague, I'm, head, I'm a chief prosecutor, but I have to go to states and I have to ask states to cooperate. And often, the person is in the state as an official functionary of that state, and I've just indicted the entire chain of command for committing war crimes, for instance, in Sudan. That makes things much more difficult. Also, it's very hard to get witnesses to uh, testify. Um, here I give an example. In the Sheshel trial, they had six insiders, six of his followers saying, I heard his words, I committed the acts, it was because he told me to. 
and all of them recant and retract their statements as a result of bribery and intimidation. Some of them recant on the stand, which is a pro every prosecutor's worst nightmare. In Nahimana, which is the media trial in Rwanda, they don't have a single genocidaire who says, I committed genocide against the Tutsi population because I heard it on the radio. They say lots of other things. They say, my mayor came to my house, my kin came to my house, I was a member of a political party branch, the Rwandan army told me to go to the barricades. They, told, they have a lot of genocidaire testifying about other factors. They couldn't find one to testify about the role of the Rwandan radio. Partly this is a kind of witness protection issue, that these international institutions just don't have the coercive apparatus of even a medium-sized nation state to protect their witnesses in what are really very similar to organized crime cases, large RICO cases in the US, organized crime, where you have really basically to change the person's face and send them to a province of Canada for them to survive. And the international institutions don't have that same capacity. Also, even if they do have some good witnesses, they have a problem of generalizing. So in criminal trials, the evidence is really tested. If you bring a witness, you have to tell the court why you're bringing the witness. You have to show them their testimony in advance. You have to bring them in, cross-examine them for a day, examine them for a day. Then they'll be cross-examined for a day. Then the judges might have any, some questions. Bringing in one witness takes you about a week. And so if you are saying that Jean-Paul Akayesu, who is a mayor in uh, Rwanda, um, incited a crowd to commit genocide against Tutsis in the country. They only had two or three witnesses in the crowd testifying as to his words. And they then have to generalize on the basis of that to a sample of two to 300 people as to what they, the, the entire crowd was thinking. Now imagine, how many of you are social scientists? How many of you are studying social science? Actually, kind of a minority. I'm going to pick on you because you're close. <laughs> if, I, if you wrote a paper for you, what department are you in? Um, philosophy. philosophy? Okay. I'm not going to pick on you. I'm going to pick on a sociologist or a political scientist. What department are you in again? Sociology. sociology. Let's say you did a qualitative piece of research on an event at the Michigan campus where there were two to three hundred people. It was a very heated political discussion and you wrote a paper about it for your professor and you said, I know exactly what the crowd was thinking because I interviewed two people in the audience that were standing next to me and I asked them what they thought. Do you think you would get an A? No. But that's what prosecutors have to do. They have to generalize to an entire group of people on the basis of this incredibly small sample as a result of the rigors of proving evidence in a criminal courtroom. This is partly because criminal trials were designed in nation states where you have essentially a murder on the streets of Miami. You have interpersonal violence. Sometimes you have organized crime. But in these kinds of cases that they're hearing, in the Balkans, in Rwanda, you have armies clashing over years. These are enormous cases. And so the, the usual tools of criminal law are simply not satisfactory for getting at the orchestrated collective nature of crimes makes it very difficult to understand massively organized events through a lens that's really designed to look at much smaller and simpler cases. So what do prosecutors do? They kind of get, come down to arguing chronology because they often lose the insiders. Here I interview Hildegard Utz Retzlaff. She's a German prosecutor, She's very experienced. She was a prosecutor in Germany and a prosecutor of the court. And she got some of the highest level cases, including the Scheschel case. And I said, well, how do you prove that it was Scheschel's speech acts that caused the violence, given that you've lost all your insiders, given that your other pieces of evidence have fallen away? 
And this is how she answered. I'll just give you a second or two to read it. And the questions are from me. So given the paucity of evidence that prosecutors have to work with, time and time again, not just in Sheshul, but in the case of Milan Babic and Radislav Berjanin, in the Yugoslav Tribunal, in other cases, in the Ruto Sang case, you saw it at the ICC, prosecutors come back to arguing chronology. Their case before the judges consists of this. The defendant said this, look what happened next. Then the defendant said this. And then look what happened. Then the defendant said this. And everywhere the defendant said this, look at the bad things that happened. And they don't say, therefore, there's a causal relationship between the two. They just leave it hanging because they know if they go the extra bit, the judges will push back. And you know what? This stuff doesn't convince the judges. And there's some good reasons why it shouldn't. So. As I argued with Keo's class earlier, human beings just have a propensity to see patterns between things that are in consecutive order. It's just a kind of uh, propensity of human cognition, that if an event follows another event, there's a tendency to see a pattern there, where that pattern may not exist in practice. So, Really, the idea that chronology proves causation was exploded with David Hume, the Scottish Enlightenment skeptic, about 250 years ago, when he said, just because two events are related in time does not mean they're connected. And really, philosophers have largely been convinced by that, and criminal courts, and historians. So, Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Ballinger, but is not the first thing that history students learn is that because an event follows another event does not mean event A caused event B. That's like history 101 week one, right? Yes. <laughs> but prosecutors are still doing it in the courts. And the judges, because that's all they're left with, the judges just don't go for it. One reason why there's so many acquittals. What about social scientists? So we've talked about fact witnesses. We've talked about prosecution case theory. What about the social scientists who are brought in as experts in these trials? This is a very interesting aspect of the trials. And is their evidence incorporated? Well, I found that yes, it was in <laughs> cases where an expert testifies about the meaning of words where the charges are the inchoate charges, like incitement to genocide, and the expert is testifying about what those words meant. The judges will listen to that, but not when they're talking about those completed crimes and they bring in here, in the case of the Sheshel trial, a sociologist, Obershaw, very distinguished, well-respected sociologist of social movements in Eastern Europe, and he looks at Sheschel's 400 speeches and he argues there's a correlation that's causal, that reaches the level of causation, and the judges reject it. They're actually more open to qualitative research than they are quantitative statistics, partly because they don't understand quantitative statistics, but they do understand nice stories. And qualitative researchers are more likely to tell them a nice story that they find persuasive. Here are the two, here's uh, Obershaw testifying, and you see Sheshel got very upset and started doing, uh, started really inter interrupting his testimony and asking him math questions, uh, which he had the answers to and trying to get, uh, to undermine Obershaw's statistical um, uh, expertise. So uh, she Sheshel was defending himself <laughs> and engaged in all kinds of disruptive uh, tactics in the courtroom. And I asked judges, there's also a problem that judges are really, they don't want to hear. So before you read this, just look at me, before you read it, and then you can read it. My interviews with judges convinced me 
that they, if they don't consider them an expert on a topic themselves to be an expert, and they don't consider themselves an expert in ballistics or rotting bodies and forensics or any of these topics of the material object world, but they do consider themselves experts in what words mean. And so this is another hurdle to bringing in a, a prosecution expert because they think, I don't need someone to tell me what words mean. I'm the expert on that, although I'm not an expert on ballistics. So there's something about the category of expertise that judges find troubling and unconvincing. So this is Judge Ori uh, answering my question about whether or not a, uh, a social science expert might be useful in a speech crimes case. If you read criminal law, it tells you in case after case after case that the standard you should use to evaluate causation is ordinary human experience. <coughs> the thinking of the common man it's in one case after another. Very resistant to the techniques of experts that depart from ordinary experience. So what do judges do? They turn to metaphors. They use them time and time again. When they're convicting the defendants, they get all metaphorical. They talk about speech as a weapon, as petrol. And in my last example, they mix their metaphors, poisoned and pounded. I counted this. I thought, no, this is my impression. Now I'm going to count it. I found 25 metaphors in three judgments on speech crimes cases. I then looked at war crimes judgments that were at, at the same level as the judgments I looked at, the same types of cases in the same courts, and I found zero. Judges are getting, when they convict, not when they acquit, but when they convict, their, their language in the decisions full of all kinds of metaphors of how speech spreads poison around the country. This happened at Nuremberg. They said Stryker, the Nazi propagandist, poisoned the minds of Germans with anti-Semitism. He injected a virus into their brains. They actually used the hypodermic needle uh, metaphor. So what's going on there? Why are we turning to metaphor? Well, I think a couple of things are happening. Again, let's go back to the problem. They have to prove this causal sequence, x to y to z, and metaphors fill in the gaps in the evidence. They paper over the cracks in the evidence. They also resolve a key problem, which is in law called the novus actus problem. The novus actus problem is this, that we are all considered individually responsible for our own actions. And unless a person is coerced under duress, they bear responsibility for what they do. So if I were to encourage this nice young lady here to go commit a crime, and she were to go do it, the court would probably say, the professor exercised terrible judgment, and we're going to leave that to the University of Michigan to deal with. But actually, she's entirely responsible for doing what she did. So how do you hold speakers responsible? Each individual person is considered a new site of the chain of causation. And by treating humans as automatons, as material objects, like weapons, treating speech as fire, petrol, you're getting over that intentionality problem, that agency problem, in your uh, use of metaphor. What has social science got to say about how hate speech works? I have time. This is good. Um, I might even get through this. So it's interesting. So we don't have a law. I tried to explain to you the parameters of the law and the difficulties that are faced the kind of problems that prosecutors face, the kind of logistical difficulties of international criminal law. What's social science saying about collective violence? What's social research telling us about how 
propaganda, indoctrination, hate speech, and inciting speech, how they work. Well, we could start with Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men. And he argued, and this has been challenged, this is why I put a woman fighter up here. This is a Bosnian Muslim woman fighter from Sarajevo, taken by my PhD student's partner, who's a photographer. Um, in Ordinary Men, Browning argues, he looks at Reserve Battalion 101, which committed all kinds of atrocities in Poland, and he says they were less motivated by ideological indoctrination than the call of duty, the bonds of comradeship. He also found pretty plausible evidence showing that about 20% of the firing squads refuse to fire. These are Nazi soldiers committing crimes in Poland. This is one of the worst examples of war crimes in human history. And you have about 20% of the soldiers not obeying. This complexifies. After the Second World War, there was a, a real rush to judgment. How was it that Germans participated in this horrible enterprise? Ah, propaganda. They were faced with Nazi propaganda. And of course, it played a role. But it didn't play the mechanistic, overwhelming role that we think it did. This kind of research has been borne out in other contexts as well. So my PhD student, whose partner took this picture, he did an ethnography of fighters in three uh, states in the Balkans and found he did interviews with uh, uh, ex-combatants, Croats, Bosnian Muslims, and Serbs. And he found, he was asking them about the role of propaganda in their participation in the conflict. And they told him all kinds of interesting things. That actually they were cut off from the media when they were on the front line. They couldn't hear uh, radio broadcasts. There was no television. They actually weren't being propagandized for a large period of the war because they just simply didn't hear it. Also, they said that they would create stories that politicians and, and, and media figures would come to the front lines. They would tell them stories that would then get transmitted throughout the media, usually in a distorted way. So they found themselves to be producers, not simply consumers or automatons of war narratives. And the main reason they gave why war crimes were committed were that paramilitaries, so these were weekend warriors coming from Zagreb, coming from Belgrade, coming from Sarajevo. These were the guys who were not enlisted soldiers, recruited. These were the guys who liked to dress up and run around with an AR-15 on weekends. And that their presence on the weekends is when many of the worst war crimes were committed. So the soldiers would say, we would take a position, we would take some of the prisoners, we'd be holding them, and then these members of this like, gang from Zagreb would come and they would shoot all our prisoners because they were there for Saturday and Sunday and they wanted some action. So this complexifies the picture of how propaganda works, or how inciting speech works. Because actually, the effects are differential according to one's positionality within the armed conflict itself. So there can be differential effects, which are completely lost in a criminal courtroom. Getting that complexity and nuanced sort of features is very hard to convey. Why? Because the prosecutors just want to say, this speaker said this, and these soldiers reacted in this way, and that's why we have the bodies in the ground. <coughs> they just don't want that complexity. I've heard prosecutors um, in the United States say, we have to treat the jury like educated seventh graders. We can't give them too much complexity. And when I played this back to a prosecutor in The Hague, he said, maybe, you know, because they're judges, they're trained, maybe like intelligent eighth graders. But that's their approach to complexity when they're telling a story about the defendant's actions and their alleged criminal liability. What we're learning, to summarize, what we're learning from the social science of armed conflict 
is that if there is causation on the part of ideology, propaganda, inciting speech, it's multifactorial. Speech acts seldom directly cause events in and of themselves. They're part of an ensemble of conditions that are jointly sufficient. So if you have result F, which is your criminal act, it's usually the result of A, B, C, and D factors, where B is the speech act. And probably if you took B out, it would have happened anyway. Which raises the question, because criminal law really likes but for causation, sine qua non. Without that act, it wouldn't have happened. So that's the kind of causation it likes best, right? If you take something out and it still happens, is it still causally related to the outcome? This is a very difficult question. So then prosecutors start to back off and say, well, it contributed, but it wasn't causal. Or it was a background condition, which enhanced the result or made it happen more quickly. Now, is that causation? Judges like but for causation. But for this factor, the event would not have happened. And they're very reticent to attach criminal liability to something that may have an enhanced a result or hastened a result, but wasn't necessary for it, a necessary and sufficient condition, as philosophers would say. This is the, the deepest and most difficult question I think I have to ask you. If you think certain types of speech in certain types of conditions should be regulated, how do you attach liability to something that is usually part and parcel of a whole set of other conditions? How do you separate it out from those other kinds of conditions? Another way of thinking about the causation of hate speech or inciting speech is that it elevates risk. It doesn't cause an ev a specific event, but it makes it more likely that that event is an outcome. It contributes to an occurrence by enhancing its likelihood. So one of the pieces of research I did for this uh, project was to um, conduct a, a, a series of psychological experiments with some colleagues at Duke. And we actually took Sheschel's speeches, and we had people read them and then answer questions about empathy and tolerance of violence. And we found some real effects of hate speech. And there's a whole social psychology literature on this. Susan Fisk at Princeton and Lasana Harris, who's at uh, University of College London. You know, if you're subjected to hate speech, even if you don't like it, even if you're not persuaded by it, it has effects on your emotional responses. It can make you less willing to reach out and be kind to another person, to empathize with their condition. What hate speech does is make us retreat into ourselves. These are identifiable effects. Does that, though, elevate the cause? Does that elevate the risk that violence may occur? It's very hard to draw a line from certain emotional effects to violent acts occurring out there in society in non-experimental conditions. So these are some of the difficult problems that one has to grapple with. Also, most of the models of propaganda are very top-down. The reader says this, the subordinates do that. What we find from the research that it's as much bottom-up as it is top-down, which again complexifies the line of causation. So what are the recommendations? I've given this talk three times to prosecutors at the uh, Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Court. So they always want to know what should we do next. And um, my advice to them is charge in color crimes. Try and stay away from causation. <laughs> Try and pick those speech acts where the politician or the railroad DJ is stupid enough to say, go out and kill this target population. That probably means you only get the most egregious speech acts 
And it probably means the coded speech, the veiled speech, the indirect speech, the dog whistle, ethnic politics. That stuff probably is much more hard to regulate. But you have to build these things very slowly. You can't just dive in and pick every form of speech that you find egregious. You have to be targeted and focused about what is achievable within the confines and rules and procedures that you're dealing with. So my advice to prosecutors is don't charge those modes of liability. Go for the most egregious inchoate crimes where the intentionality to incite a crime is clearly there in the Speech Act itself. And the judges can just look at it and say, oh, and Gilbertoire, he said kill twisties. You don't really need a big case around that. You, know, you don't need to build a giant prosecution superstructure of argumentation. It's pretty persuasive uh, in itself. Disfavor those modes of liability, like instigating, that require proof of direct causation. Exceptions. You have insiders that you really, really believe in, for whatever reason, good or bad. If the crimes are completed, then there are two forms of liability that make sense to me, ordering and complicity. Ordering makes sense because it gets over the mental causation problem. Remember mental causation? Proving that the intentionality of the material perpetrator was the result of their leader telling them to do something? That's problematic when you don't have a, a, a military structure around it. You have to prove persuasion, and that's very hard to do. With ordering, you've pretty much got it all there in the order. You have the intentionality in the order, and you have the mental causation in the military structure itself. So proving causation that the prisoners were shot because the soldier got the order from the superior officer to shoot the prisoners, mental causation is not really a huge mystery there. Defense will try and make it a mystery. But it's pretty clear that that's going to hold more water than some of the other modes of liability. And then complicity. And here I want to end and argue that We need to think again about speakers who use very targeted ethnic racial language in a very difficult and dangerous situation. It is tempting to say that the violence that ensues is directly linked to what they're saying. I do not favor this interpretation. Not because I don't think it's true. It may be but because I think it's really hard to prove, evidentially. Complicity, however, is quite persuasive to me. Why? Let's look at it a little bit more. If incitement is more persuasive as complicity, first of all, we have a legal precedent, and that's always good. Stryker is convicted as an accomplice. Not that he caused the Holocaust. But the Holocaust was happening anyway, and he was an accomplice. He published Der Sturmer, which was constantly going on about Jews you know, doing this or that, totally invented stories, fictional stories about Jews eating babies and blah, blah, blah. It was all made up. But he was an accomplice, and that's the basis for his conviction at Nuremberg. Here's the definition of complicity in international law. Practical assistance, encouragement, or moral support that has a substantial effect. Okay, you still have the substantial effect, which is hard. But encouragement and moral support sounds a lot like what these speakers are doing. They're encouraging others. The courts have said, what is substantial effect? In burgeoning, they said, anything above de minimis. That means anything above the most minimal of contribution. Basically, it's any effect the prosecution can show of any type of contribution. It doesn't have to be a but-for or a sine qua non. It doesn't have to be an essential contribution. It just has to be a contribution. So the causal requirement is very low. And there's no causation in complicity after the fact. So Blagojevich, he's a superior officer. He comes back to his base. 
His subordinates have just shot a bunch of prisoners that they've taken. He's a Serb, Bosnian Serb. They've just shot these prisoners, and he says, oh, merd, we better bury them somewhere so we don't get caught. He's convicted of complicity to murder on the basis of an ex post facto burying of the dead bodies. So he wasn't causal to their murder, but he was complicit with it. So causation doesn't matter in, in, in aiding and abetting if it comes after the fact. Interesting point here about US law. If an individual commits a crime and another individual shouts their support for it, and the individual committing the crime doesn't even hear them, can they be convicted of aiding and abetting the person who shouts the support? Even if they're not heard? Yes, they can. <laughs> yes, they have been. There have been cases where a person shoots another person dead, and someone in the crowd yells their support for it. The shooter doesn't even hear it. The person yelling their support is convicted of complicity to murder. There's a whole slew of case law on that. So that suggests that moral encouragement, moral support encouragement is actually what they're doing. And the causation requirement is quite low. What's the intentionality requirement? Well, they simply have to have knowledge of a crime or know that it's foreseeable. One of the objections to complicity is that it, it, it leads to a lower sentence. But luckily, a social political scientist did an analysis and finds that actually there is a lower sentence, but it's not a lot. So why not use the mode of liability that's more appropriate? Prosecutors are always trying to hit the ball out of the park. They're trying to get the biggest conviction they can. My advice to them is go small. Get what you can get. Get complicity. The, the requirements of intentionality and causation are much lower. Likelihood of conviction is much higher. Sentencing, a little bit lower, but not a lot. And this conforms much more to what social scientists are saying. I'll just end on this note. I think what I've tried to show is how social science can inform what law does. Law has to have a theory of human behavior. In speech crimes cases, the judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, they're all presenting a theory of how speech works, a model of how it operates, how speech affects behavior. Most of the times, in the criminal court setting, that model is just wrong. <laughs> it's partial. It's kind of deformed. It's being instrumentalized. But I'm trying to give an example where what social scientists have been saying about the orchestration of collective violence, what we're learning about the kind of analyses done by Scott Strauss in Rwanda, uh, a number of writers in the Balkans, about how the actual uh, armed conflicts operated, that information needs to come back into the courts and inform how they adjudicate the crimes themselves so that they do so in a way that is more appropriate to the nature of the crimes. So I'll just end on that note. Thank you. Do we have about 20 minutes for questions and answers? Sure. Uh, I, I can do it. Yeah. I'll start at the back because the back often gets avoided. Um, oh. um, thank you for your uh, presentation. I was wondering if, in the cases you looked at of crimes against humanity, if there were different outcomes for different categories of victims if right. the cases and the results for crimes against a religious group or an ethnic group or a language group impacted some of the outcomes. So, so in other words, would your, in your suggestions for prosecutors, right. would the category of victim as a type of humanity uh, influence the way you would see them pursuing a mm -hmm. case? So that's a really good question. And the honest answer is I don't know. Partly because there are only 35 cases, and it's not really a big enough sample. So really, where, all I'm looking at is Nuremberg, which is a case 
primarily of religious persecution, but not exclusively. Rwanda, which is ethnic stroke racial. Um, former Yugoslavia, which is religious, national, ethnic, and racial. No, probably not racial, but certainly ethnic. And then uh, the International Criminal Court, which the cases have only really been Kenya, which is inter-ethnic rivalry. And so um, if I were to speculate a little bit on your question, so there are four protected categories in international law, national groups, religious groups, ethnic groups, and racial groups. And they're protected in the Genocide Convention and also in the Crimes Against Humanity as it relates to persecution. Persecution also includes some other groups, disability, mental health, sexuality. Uh, they also can be subjected to persecution, but there are no cases on any of those that I've just mentioned. Um, in each of these speech crimes cases, the prosecutors have to show that the target group actually exists. And so in the early Rwandan cases, they spent a lot of time talking about the distinctions between Tutsis and, and Hutus, which makes no sense at all. Because actually, these are historical categories with no biological or objective basis. So religious groups, however, seem to present a more kind of clear, codified, category that judges might find more convincing. Uh, so if I were to speculate, I, 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 would, I would probably say that speech crimes cases would be more likely to succeed over the long term, and I may be wrong, but over the long term with respect to inter-religious rivalry than some of the other categories, or national minority groups, which again are more easily established in the minds of judges, who have, may I point out, um, only a rudimentary sociological grasp of these categories. Partly because they were never defined in any of the conventions that protected them. So they're waiting on the case law to define them. And the case law is 20 years old. If we think about criminal law, you know, US criminal law comes from British criminal law, which went for about 1,000 years before it got to the United States. That's a long period of trial and error, right? International criminal law has been going for 20 years. And so its, it's precedent basis is, is really quite thin. And there are all kinds of problems. And those problems take time to work themselves out. Oh, yeah. yeah. You were talking toward the beginning about <clears throat> the balance of responsibility between different players. And there were two things that made me think about that I wondered what you thought. One is the issue of um, the internet recruitment and some would say brainwashing of young Muslims to go and join ISIS, when in a sense it's their own act. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I was thinking about was in terms of child soldiers in Africa. And I recently heard that in Africa there were people who clearly had been kidnapped people who were turned into child soldiers and they kidnapped when they were maybe eight or 10 years old. And then I heard about there's at least consideration of prosecuting some of them when they're older. Right. Because not that the argument was they weren't any more, any less or more or less perverted in a sense than other people, but because of the magnitude of the bad things they did. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering what you thought about. Right. It's Kind of speech and kind of not, but I think yeah. So um, I can say more about the second issue, but the first issue is um, there are people much better placed than me to comment on it, and I would I am here. It's true. Uh, I would recommend taking a look at the work of Molly Land, who's written on human rights and the internet. Um, recruitment is a really interesting issue. So. What if we were dealing with inciting speech that didn't encourage individuals to commit crimes, but merely to join a, a, an armed force that itself was a joint criminal enterprise that was committing crimes? And 
The prosecutors made this argument, but not as strongly as they might have in the Sheschel case. When asked by the judges, OK, so what type of contribution did Sheschel make? They said, well, he was a recruiter for the Bosnian Serb army and the Serb paramilitaries. And he recruited 30 to 40,000 people. And he actually did have uh, his own units in the other units. And they were paramilitaries embedded in the other units. So is recruitment uh, considered a contribution? If it is, it's a form of complicity rather than direct perpetration of a crime. So uh, again, I would say that recruitment would fall within complicity. And we don't really have many cases of uh, individuals recruiting for ISIS to go on. Um, there's the conviction of Suleiman al Ghaib, uh, who was convicted in December, I believe, 2015. He was a propagandist for al Qaeda. He was uh, Osama bin Laden's son-in-law. And he's convicted in a, in a, a New York court of, um, and I have to get this right. I'm trying to, it wasn't uh, aiding and abetting. It was uh, more than providing material assistance to a terrorist organization. It was a much higher, and I would have to look this up, but he was convicted of a, of a much higher level of participation than you would expect. And, and basically, his involvement was sending out videos trying to recruit people to Al Qaeda. So I would have to take a look at that in more depth. Uh, but we don't really have a lot in the way of precedent on that. Uh, and at the international level, it hasn't really been dealt with. It's only really at the domestic level. Child soldiers in Africa, there, there's a, a kind of a, a consensus that Many crimes, so here I'm thinking about Sierra Leone, Liberia. Um, I was on a UNICEF um, technical committee that wrote policy on demobilization of child soldiers in Sierra Leone in 2000. And we recommended that child soldiers not be prosecuted for any criminal acts they committed uh, under the age of 18. That they may be prosecuted for things they did afterwards, but we recommended that the Truth Commission, the Sierra Leone Tribune, uh, Special Court for Sierra Leone, and the Sierra Leone domestic criminal justice system go after bigger fish than child soldiers. Um, that was largely followed, not because we said it, but because there were other good reasons to do so. But the individuals who objected to this did point out that many domestic criminal jurisdictions hold minors responsible for serious crimes like murder. So in US prisons, there are many, many juveniles, including on death row in Florida, uh, many individuals who committed um, uh, crimes like murder who, are, uh, who have been um, prosecuted as adults within the criminal justice system. What's, what's the role of what's often called brainwashing in this kind of stuff? Yeah. So that's one of the difficulties. One of the, um, the things we're learning about child soldiers is that uh, a child soldier who may have committed a crime at, say, 14 or 15 during an armed conflict uh, was often recruited at age six or seven, before, obviously before they could give any consent. So I would say the standard in international law is uh, don't prosecute anyone for crimes committed during an armed conflict um, uh, b uh, who, who committed those crimes under the age of 18. However, domestic criminal jurisdictions do that all the time. Uh, and, and there's an argument, uh, one of the arguments in favor of that is that there are quite a few armies, uh, including the British Army, um, which recruit soldiers at 17 and put them in combat situations. So uh, Britain, for many years, uh, I don't know if it's changed recently. I last looked about five years ago. But certainly while I was living in Britain, there were 17-year-olds being put in Northern Ireland. Uh, and they were at barricades. And often when there was a shooting of a joyrider, so one of uh, in, uh, in the Falls Road in Belfast, one of the Saturday night pastimes of the Catholic youth was to steal a car and drive it around at high speed. 
And often they would turn a corner, and there would be a British Army patrol there or barricade, and the soldiers would simply fire into the car, and people would be killed. And this happened all the time. A lot of times, those soldiers at the barricades were under 18. They were uh, Brits you know, who had just recently been recruited and trained. So, one of the, so that's a kind of complex question. But uh, international law tends to be a little bit more progressive on these issues than municipal law. And the standard is don't prosecute. Yeah, Haji. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're right that it's filling causal space, but I just want to point, and maybe you get to this in the book, is that they're probably using very similar language that was used by the, the, per, the perpetrator. And the, the poisoning of the mind is a perfect example. Is that, was the, that was the exact metaphor and language that was being used by the Nazis, right? So the fact that it transferred into the language of the prosecution is, could have been subliminal, but what it, what it bespeaks is that at the level of the speech act coming down from the, the person who's transmitting the insightful speech, they're using metaphor as well to, to bridge something between speech and causality, mm -hmm. which is go kill Tutsis is one thing, but I think that weaving it into a metaphor, particularly with myth and more kind of different figurative language, probably actually has more of an effect. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, so the, the transmission of information kind of needs a, it needs a medium. Yeah. And metaphor and figurative language is probably often the medium. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it's so it's being, so there's this kind of contagion going on there between the language that's being used to incite violence mm -hmm. and the way it's then being used to convict it. Mm -hmm. I find that extremely interesting. And so my question then is, I wonder how your work relates to someone like David Rias against remembrance. Right? And, and Rieff's argument there is that we tend to think that things like epics or poetry and song are useful for reconciliation and the fusing of, of communities after violence. But he basically is saying that, that song and, and poetry, because of its mnemonic function, because it's really good at planting something in your head because of a melody or a metaphor, actually is able to carry over generation after generation. Mm -hmm certain kinds of animus. And so the, the transmission itself and the figurative language that is used is a kind of, is, is actually having a lot of effect on the way that violence is potentially manifest as a way propaganda works. And so it's so it's unbelievably diffuse. Definitely. So I take your point. Uh, I think it's a good point. I, I accept a lot of it. I'm going to push back slightly at the end. Um, there's no doubt that figurative speech helps in persuading and emotionally, uh, emotionally shifting an audience. Um, if I were an inciting speaker and I simply said, go out and beat up the first person of X group that you find, that would be a kind of bold statement. But if I said to you, members of X group are coming after you, they're coming to steal your children. They're coming to steal your wives. They're coming to do terrible things. We might not even know if they come. If, if I started bringing out the mythology and the, the often heard canards about Group X and how they behave, that might be enough to effectuate the outcome that, that I hold to be desirable. There's no doubt that figurative speech assists in persuasion and in communication. And it creates a kind of uh, a narrative upon which to hang violent acts and make them meaningful. And to encourage violent acts, one must make them meaningful. And narrative and metaphors do that. There are some legal thinkers like Cass Sunst Sunstein who say that um, judges use metaphors when there's not a lot of precedent in the law and they want to create new law. And so he applauds judicial expressivism, that's what he calls it. And his example is the civil rights movement. In the United States, during the civil rights era, judges get really, Supreme Court judges and other judges, get very metaphorical. Why? Because there's not a strong basis 
in existing law for the kind of civil rights statements that they want to make. And so Sunstein points to that and says, look, judicial innovation requires the use of metaphor and expressive and figurative language. And that's a good thing. And it's always progressive. I'm skeptical of the always progressive part. Because I think the figurative language can be used in the other direction, too. And so I worry that figurative language is the language of demagogues and populists. And so in that moment, and in, I think, this precise moment, where we're experiencing a wave of populism in the United States, it makes me feel you can make up your own mind. It makes me feel like I want to use very careful and precise language and not be very metaphorical. Because I want my ideas to walk on the ground very carefully and build evidence and persuade that way, rather than pulling yet more at the emotional heartstrings of the listener, because they're getting pulled all the time. And they might wear out, to use a metaphor. <laughs> There's also a due process argument. And that's this. How would you like to be prosecuted? I would like the charges against me to be clearly stated. I would like for those charges to be evidenced as best they can and for me to challenge that evidence. And if I'm convicted, I would like to be convicted in a careful, precise language that I could appeal against. But if the judge gets into all kinds of figurative stuff about how I poison the minds of my students and I use my speech as a weapon and I pounded the listener, with a virus of hate speech, it's harder for me to say, no, I didn't. And that violates my 14th Amendment <laughs> right to due process, I feel. Totally. I mean, I was concerned yeah. that I think that we should be able to prosecute these things so that you're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. It's that the force of language, it's very obvious that in these, that the judges are confronted with the diffusion of language and, it, and trying to make a leap between the speech act and causality, they themselves yes. are performing the same thing that was being that was performed. There's a mirroring going on there. Right. And that is just absolutely fascinating. It's and fascinating that we can see why they do it. Yeah. But if you're going to adjudicate figurative speech, should you use figurative speech? Absolutely not. My answer is I'm, I'm very reticent to absolutely. countenance that. But it's interesting. I'm grateful that you're, you take this view because I presented this to some literature folks there when I was at University of Amsterdam, and they were all over me. They were like, metaphor is everywhere. You want, you want to get rid of metaphor. Forget about it. It's part of human thought, cognition, speech. And this is going to happen, so why not just live with it and come up with better metaphors? That was their objection. And you know, I was outnumbered in that particular room. Yes. Right. Into your argument. Um, and so, you know, here it's not that, that there's a mirroring effect, but possibly the, the misunderstanding of what language means in that original context, depending upon how the, the role of the translator. So, you know, the, you know Ellen Elias Bursa yes. talked about like what they did in the sense of ship study, you know, when they do right. it in testimony, how do you convey what that meant in the Yugoslav context? Yeah. Right? Right. So international trials suffer from a problem that domestic trials don't suffer from. And that's the problem of translation. In some of the Rwandan trials, you have uh, witnesses speaking Kinyarwanda. And they had translators who couldn't go straight into French or English, but had to go through Swahili first. So sometimes the judges would ask a question. So some of the judges were French, and it would go French, English, Swahili, Kinyarwanda, answer, Kinyarwanda, Swahili, French, English. And eight, eight steps, we know what happens in eight steps. Meaning is lost, and you enter this Alice in Wonderland world where you don't know what you're talking about anymore. Um, and uh, Dr. Bellinger 
cited a recent book by um, Elias Bursat. She was a former interpreter at the Yugoslav Tribunal, and she wrote a very nice book on the, the, the problems of translation in the courtroom. What they decided to do in the Yugoslav Tribunal was to leave certain ethnic slurs, like balias and shiptar, in the original and allow the defense and prosecution to argue over what it meant in the trial itself. And so they didn't. So balias is a, work that many, a word that many Serbs and Croats would use to refer to Muslims. And it translates literally as Turk, because the argument that Croatian and Serbian nationalists were, were that these people used to be us, but the Ottomans came and they converted to Islam, and they're traitors, and we're going to call them this nasty word, which means Turk. So instead of translating, and everyone knows that this is what it means, instead of translating it as Turk, they used the word balias, and they allowed the defense to say, ah, oh, this is an ugly word, but it doesn't really mean what they say it means in the prosecution, and they allowed the prosecution to make their case. In speech crimes cases, a lot of times it really does come down to what does the ethnic slur mean? Like, how bad is it? And in our language, we know there are a whole variety of ethnic slurs in the United States that are used on a daily basis. And there are times when they're really bad, and there are times when they're not so bad, and it depends on who's using them, singing them, the context, who's saying it. You know, there are a whole variety of factors. That, and as US citizens, in this context, we can more or less get a picture of that. But imagine if you're a judge sitting on a court in a completely different country with completely different vocabulary. And you've got the prosecution and defense trying to explain it to you and bringing in experts who then tell you about the use of these words. You sometimes see this hilarity played out in the Supreme Court when they get cases of rappers that come before the Supreme Court or judges and they have to explain to them you know, what rap is and what language is used in rap. And you see these old fuddy-duddy judges saying, OK, I think I get it now. Play that P. Diddy one more time. You know, this Alanis case is one of them, um, Anthony Alanis. And there have been other cases. So um, the translation issue is intractable. It may, I mean, you could argue international courts really shouldn't touch this cultural stuff because they don't have the cultural know-how. That's an argument that many people made in the former Yugoslavia, that here are these judges from Germany sitting in the Netherlands adjudicating cases that happen in the Balkans. Um, I would like to believe that translation is difficult but not impossible, and that um, there are some examples. And, and I think Matthias Ruzendana does this. He's the Rwandan linguist who said, look, Inyenzi means cockroach. Everyone knows it means cockroach. In some circumstances, during the genocide, contextually, it was used to mean all Tutsis. And the court largely agreed with that, and I think rightfully so. The defense was saying there were lots of contexts when it didn't mean Tutsis, and they were right too. The question is, when the person who's in the dock spoke, was it intended in that way? And those are very difficult issues for courts to adjudicate, especially when they're international courts. Um, and I'd like to incite a warm feeling of gratitude toward him. Please join me in thanking you, Professor. Thank you.